Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Scott Sherry, and I'm a partner in the restructuring and insolvency group of the Brisbane Office of Clayton Newts. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this joint presentation with McGrath Nickel in respect to infrastructure and the construction industry. Before we commence our session today, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place, the Turrbal Jagera peoples, and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Now, during the webinar, you'll notice that there is a Q&A function on the right-hand side of your screen. So we encourage you to send through your questions as they arise. And uh, we'll do our best to answer them at the end of the presentation. And if we don't answer them, then we'll certainly do our best to um, get in contact with you afterwards and we'll hope to get around to everyone. Um, also, there'll be a link to the session that will be sent around afterwards so that you can see the recording um, and have a look at it at your leisure. Uh, infrastructure investment will inevitably play a part in and a pivotal role in the global post-pandemic economic recovery. Australia is no exception, and the current recovery measures put in place by our federal government will ultimately need to be complemented and then supplemented uh, by ongoing investment in infrastructure, which has been high on the agenda for some time. What we sought to do is to bring together a panel of experts to give varying perspectives on the current climate, what we might expect, and also what we should look out for uh, by way of early warning signs, either as a funder, a principal, a head contractor, or a subcontractor. As you'll see during the course of this presentation, those early warning signs for one side of the contractual bargain might also be real opportunities for the other side of the contract to consider how they may best restructure or otherwise reshape their respective businesses. I'd now like to introduce our panel. Well, we as a firm have had a long and close relationship with McGrath Nickel over the years and have relied on them professionally over many years and are very grateful to have the opportunity to present together with them. First, on my left, is Jamie Harris. Jamie is a foundation partner of McGrath Nickel and is a highly regarded restructuring specialist with more than 20 years of experience and particular expertise in managing large, complex, formal restructuring engagements and as well as providing strategic advice and implementing solutions to stakeholders. Jamie will be taking us through a case study in one of his recent engagements, but notably, as also uh, with respect to Barella Bar Coal, the McAleese Group, Hughes Drilling, Bruce Connections and Cubby Station, has had a number of recent engagements, just to name a few. We've had the great pleasure as a firm in working with Jamie over a number of decades, and we're very pleased he could join us today to share his experience and insights. Next. You'll see Mark Holland. Mark is a director of McGrath Nickel with more than 12 years experience as a restructure, turnaround and financial advisory specialist. Mark has worked across all levels of government, private sector companies and listed groups to help improve operational and financial performance, undertake restructuring and manage periods of organisational change. Mark has worked across a broad range of industries, including agriculture, government, hotel and leisure, infrastructure, property, mining, services and retail. Recently, Mark has acted as a turnaround advisor for a large Queensland PPP infrastructure asset, which included a safe harbour review. He has also managed the operational restructure and subsequent divestment of RCR Tomlinson's upgrade to maintenance division located in Newcastle. I'd also like to introduce Chris Keane, uh, who's there next to Mark. Chris is a special counsel at Clayton Newts in our major projects and construction team. Chris has broad experience across development finance and procurement, and delivery of major infrastructure projects, including PPPs. Chris has been a member of the core teams involved in the development, financing, procurement, and delivery of many recent road, rail, tunnel, and airport infrastructure projects. In Queensland, Chris has and continues to advise our clients in respect of major projects, such as Cross River Rail, Inner City Bypass, the Toowoomba Bypass, Gold Coast Commonwealth Games Village, Legacy Way Airport, and Lincoln Clem 7. Thanks very much, Chris. You'll also see listed on your screen Kim Condon. Uh, Kim will hopefully join us shortly. We're having some difficulties in dialing Kim in. Uh, Kim is a senior associate in the restructuring and insolvency practice here in Brisbane. Kim's acted for liquidators, administrators and receivers, as well as a large range of corporate public sector clients in Queensland, Western Australia and New South Wales. Kim is a very valued member of our Brisbane team, though pre-COVID has spent a large amount of her time in Western Australia representing resource companies in large multi-layered commercial disputes. 
Uh, part of the reason that Kim is dialing in and given she's not on, it gives me the opportunity to say this. Unfortunately, Kim is self-isolating, having travelled to Adelaide in recent weeks uh, to enjoy some time at the wineries. Uh, whilst Kim says it was worth it, uh, she's currently COVID-free but unable to attend the office. So hopefully we'll be able to dial Kim in shortly. For today, what we intend to cover are market insights. Where are we at? Where might we be going? Secondly, what are the early warning signs of distress, both from a perspective, as I said before, of a principal or a funder, as well as a contractor or subcontractor? And lastly, what are the key response considerations? Uh, as I said before, don't forget the Q&A function on the right-hand side of your screen. Please send questions through. Uh, but to kick us off, Chris, I might start with you. What's the current state of play for the construction infrastructure market? What are you seeing? Thanks, Scott. Um, I think in answering that question um, and considering the, the current, what the current market looks like, um, it's worth considering um, projects and contractors in two broad classes. Um, so the first of those being the so-called mega projects, the multi-billion dollar cross river rails, Melbourne Metro, Sydney Metro type projects um, that are typically undertaken by your tier one contractors. Um, and the second category is what I loosely call everything else. So that's anything from your high rise office towers, large apartment buildings, right down to your um, sort of house renovations. So those are the projects typically performed by anywhere from your tier two and three contractors right down to your, to your local house builders. Um, and I think it's fair to say that there's legitimate concerns regarding contractors across both classes at the moment, um, but for differing reasons. Um, broadly speaking, the impact of COVID itself this year um, has probably been you know, fairly consistent across the two classes. And by that, I mean the sort of day-to-day -day impacts of, of the pandemic. So the social distancing on sites and impacts of travel, um, uh, you know, supply disruption, all of those sorts of things that have impacted on just about every industry have, have of course, affected the construction industry. Um, but it's probably fair to say that the construction industry is fair, better than most in that regard. Um, generally, construction projects have been able to continue. Um, the current hard lockdown in, in South Australia is perhaps um, one of the first times where there's been a real um, tough restriction on such projects. But so, so while that's fairly consistent, where I think the classes of projects differ um, is the broader impacts um, related to the pandemic. Um, so there have been a number of industries that have been significantly impacted by, by the um, economic impacts of the pandemic, and that in turn has affected their construction needs. Um, so universities are a prime example where in recent years, their whole strategy has been built um, upon an influx of international students. Without that, it's really testing, um, testing the way in which universities are run. And um, the latest figures are suggesting that um, there'll be a billion dollars less university spending on construction projects this year and for the next couple of years. Um, and then, you know, of course, student accommodation and apartments in general um, will feel the knock-on effects of that. So, um, yeah, the slide that you've got up there is some examples of, of those impacts on the industry. Government, though, has been very vocal in its desire to use the construction and infrastructure industry as a key pillar in the economic recovery. Um, and the federal government budget provided numerous stimulus measures to exist with that, and the next slide's got, got some of those on it. Um, Recent indicators are suggesting that these measures are starting to see a pickup, um, particularly in the house market, uh, house building market. But even even there, um, the forecasts are that they won't get back to pre uh, peak pre pandemic levels for another five years. So for that everything else category, um, the summary is there've been broad impacts across the market, um, which are going to, um, of course, uh, adversely affect many contractors. For the mega project uh, category though, things are a little bit different. They've generally been able to carry on, um, so the relevant contractors haven't been subject to the same economic impacts of the pandemic, like the uh, other ones we spoke about. And in fact, as part of the stimulus measures, um, 
there's even more of those huge projects coming to market. So in the last week, the New South Wales government's put out its budget, which includes um, two new Sydney Metro projects, which each on its own is a, is a huge project um, on, on top of all the other building that's already going on. With these contractors, though, I think there's actually a risk that um, this is just going to, all this extra work is going to exacerbate issues in the market that already existed pre COVID. Um, because what we've seen in recent years is that despite the unprecedented amount of work going on, particularly down, right down the East Coast, many of the contractors in the market have really been struggling. Uh, it's been referred to at times as the profitless boom. Um, back in March, before the pandemic had impacted on the industry too much, the John Holland CEO was quoted as saying, we are in the midst of Australia's biggest infrastructure boom, but as an industry, we are teetering on the brink of, brink of collapse. Uh, and now we're adding even more projects. Um, so at all levels of the market, I think both due to the pandemic and for other reasons, um, care certainly needs to be taken to ensure that contractors are able to re remain viable um, you know, in the coming period. Um, Mark, did you want to talk any more about that? Yeah, thanks, Chris. I might um, just quickly ask Scott to uh, move to the next slide and we'll just pause very quickly there uh, while the viewers get the opportunity to sort of read the, the text that we have on the slide there. I think as Chris has suggested, there's there's no doubt that uh, what we've seen over the last couple of years has been a contraction in the, the contra construction and infrastructure market uh, that has obviously impacted on the financial performance of a number of players. What does, though, look exciting is the, the 2020 government boost uh, and all the incentives that the, the federal government has recently announced for the construction space. However, this won't be the, uh, this won't, while, while positive for the industry, it's, there's still a range of warning signs that businesses will need to closely monitor. In our view, uh, having a strong balance sheet and effectively managing your balance sheet over, uh, over a period of time as the, as the construction market begins to uh, intensify once again will be very important uh, to ensure that businesses uh, win and execute more than their fair, fair share of work. Scott, I might hand back to you to introduce the next section. Yeah, Mark, there are times when our clients come to us in our respective practices and it's too late. It's too late for there to be any viable restructuring, turnaround strategies put in place, or at a minimum, the options are limited. What can we do to get ahead of the curve and try and pick up some of the early indicators of financial distress? Thanks, Scott. Um, so we like to, uh, so I suppose over a number of years in the restructuring and financial advisory market, um, we have observed a number of instances where signs, uh, lead indicators of potential distress or issues uh, are exhibited, which can be closely monitored uh, and um, actioned upon to help safeguard, uh, to help safeguard a business. Um, I suppose who would have thought this time last year a thing called coronavirus could cause the share market to, to drop by 30 per cent, um, business profits to contract uh, and in parts of Australia um, things being shut down for, for the best part of six months. Um, so I suppose there's uh, in, in our minds there's a range of warning signs that, are, that a business um, can uh, monitor, observe uh, and act upon reasonably regularly and we generally uh, suggest that businesses monitor their own warning signs and uh, indica lead indicators of potential distress or an issue on a quarterly basis. But the, the, the warning signs also exhibited by their key contract counterparties that, uh, that, that they, uh, they work with throughout a construction project. Generally early warning signs, uh, we, we, we tend to think they're, they're grouped into six key elements. Uh, and we can see that on the, the, the slide there on the right hand side. Macro factors are your things such as your, your market, um, movement in foreign exchange, government intervention. Life cycle will be where a business may well sit inside, the, inside its maturity curve and whether or not that may play an influence in the, the success and movement of that business moving forward. Culture and control, things such as management turnover, uh, the, the quality of, of a management team or the CEO or the CFO. 
management information systems. How quickly does a business produce data, data that is accurate, produce budgets, produce forecasts, produce timely financial information and operational information to allow informed and timely decision making to be, to be completed. From financial performance, um, financial performance is obviously a more uh, easier one to, to, to monitor, to observe and to, and to keep an eye on. Uh, there's obviously a range of financial um, and non-financial metrics that can be observed and monitored uh, both for your own business as well as your, your contractual counterparties and we'll talk to some of those in a little while. And from a key stakeholder perspective, who are the key stakeholders? How strong are the contractual arrangements between their key stakeholders and are there things like disputes that, that may cause issues with inside a, a construction project? Ultimately, um, knowing and identifying and monitoring the, the lead indicators will lead to, uh, to, to better planning and better responsive action if things uh, do begin to, to, uh, to, go, uh, to go south. Um, whilst early warning signs won't necessarily be a complete safeguard to financial stress, our view is that it's just another management practice uh, or a, a tool on a trade's belt that can be used to help plan, help a business perform and to ultimately manage business risk. Over the next couple of slides, um, I'll focus on some of the topical uh, early warning signs that, that we've seen recently impacting some of the construction uh, players in the market uh, and that, were, and that in, uh, impact uh, construction groups, uh, whether, they, whether they're contractors, subcontractors uh, across the across the contracting uh, supply chain. There's no shortage of market information and data available that does suggest that uh, the market has contracted over, over the last few years. Uh, in fact, the, the performance of construction index suggests that the market's at almost its lowest point since the GFC. Um, there's a range of industry groups uh, which also release various indicators to suggest that that market uh, it has tightened somewhat. Uh, the ACIF releases data which, which shows that as well. However, I think probably more relevant at the moment um, is some of the, the recent, uh, recent things that we, we've seen in the construction space from a market perspective um, that provide both benefits but also warning signs to business moving forward. Obviously, the, the budget boost that Chris um, spoke a fair bit about um, is, a, is a great opportunity for businesses moving forward. But that with opportunity comes risk um, and the challenge for business moving forward will be to ensure that um, they have, that they're able to, uh, they're, they're, that they're able to maintain a, a financial position such that they can manage an uplift in activity moving forward. From an industry reform, um, look, we've seen uh, over the last couple of years, the introduction of the security of payments uh, or changes to security of payments legislation. We've also seen uh, discussion, continued discussion around project bank accounts. And we've also um, most recently seen the payment times reporting scheme. What is interesting and what can be um, perceived as a warning sign will be how quickly businesses adapt to the new legislation, put it into practice and, and push forward uh, using the, the new industry reform. Businesses that are slow uh, to take up new reform are often then left behind and may be at greater risk than, than uh, some of their uh, competitors. At an organisational level, um, we cover the things, uh, generally we cover uh, things such as culture and control, um, management information systems and, and key stakeholders. Um, and we, we highlight there on the, on the screen some of the, some of the warning signs we've probably seen uh, over the course of the last uh, few years. Poor tendering procedures um, is one that often, often comes up when we look back at projects that have been successful or projects that have been unsuccessful. Uh, tendering in terms of obviously having close control and understanding of what uh, your margins and, and numbers look like so that you're um, putting in place or so that you're tendering at the, at the right price point. Um, poor tendering procedures uh, can often mean that uh, your tender ultimately ends up uh, being less competitive than, than some of your counterparties. 
Weak management information systems is another warning sign that we quite regularly come across. We seem to find that there's a, a varying degree in how well a business or how well different businesses use the data and the information that they have available to them to produce timely, accurate results for the purpose of decision making. Strong information management systems um, also uh, help protect against fraud uh, and, and risk around cyber attacks. Operational disruption, no doubt um, 2020 has meant that businesses are probably now more equipped and better place to deal with operational disruption than probably what we have been in the past. Um, however, um, as we've seen in Adelaide over the course of the last, uh, last week or so, operational disruption will continue to be a thing moving forward and businesses should be, have plans and strategies in place to deal with them. And from a contractor and stakeholder management, um, we continue to, uh, we, well, we often see uh, issues where contracts are misunderstood, uh, the contracting objectives are not well uh, aligned throughout the, the chain, uh, throughout the, the construction supply chain, uh, which lead to disputes, financial loss and counterparty failure. From a financial perspective, and this is the, the section, the accountants in the room, uh, Jamie and myself always generally love to talk to. Uh, I actually recently heard a very interesting statistic. 95% uh, of mid-market businesses monitor their, cap, monitor their turnover on a monthly basis. 30% of mid-market businesses monitor their profitability on a monthly basis. Yet only 5% of mid-market businesses monitor their cash flow on a monthly basis. I thought as an accountant that was fairly astonishing. Um, and uh, after all, um, when you're trying to pay Scott's legal fees, uh, I don't think Scott will appreciate uh, turning up and paying them in uh, accrued profits. Uh, ultimately, it's cash that pays the legal fees, the electricity and so forth. So, uh, you know, our view is that careful management of cash uh, and the drivers behind cash, such as working capital, is vital, vitally important. Um, our, our, our view at McGrath Nickel um, and, and the view shared by many accountants is uh, it's, it's critical to be monitoring uh, and constant, constantly keeping on top of a range of financial uh, metrics and, and, uh, and signs that allow you to test uh, the, the strength of one's business or the strength of a counterparty's business. Uh, we often do that through a number of uh, profitability, liquidity, uh, leverage, efficiency ratios, uh, as well as other financial uh, mechanisms, and, and some of those are, are, are shown on the board. Um, these can be derived from obviously your profit and loss, your balance sheet, your cash flow, uh, and then they can be tested against um, or benchmarked against historical results. Uh, or industry standards or other industry data that becomes available, um, such as, as, as an example, um, testing against the, the, the McGranical Working Capital Report that was, uh, that was I think, released earlier this week. Um, so I might just quickly just mention the Working Capital Report while, 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 we, um, while we're on that topic. Um, the Working Capital Report um, has some great uh, financial metrics and benchmarking for the construction industry. Uh, and for any viewers on the call who haven't yet received that, um, feel free to go onto the McGrath-Nickel website uh, and download that. It is actually a great tool for any CFO or financial manager to uh, test what their working capital metrics might be uh, compared to the industry as a whole. Whilst monitoring ratios and actual and uh, financial importance is obviously very important, there's other things like audit results, um, uh, sorry, qualified audit opinion, high staff turnover, insolvency of related entities and so forth, which can be monitored um, as warning signs or show signs, which, uh, which might indicate that an action might be taken. So uh, who might be impacted from early warning signs? Um, we obviously show it up here on the board and it may well be, uh, it, it can be anyone to be honest, um, and Jamie will talk to an, uh, an example of that fairly shortly. Um, but. Maybe just um, if we just sort of think about, obviously there's a range of warning signs that, that might be exhibited by a business or uh, one's contractual counterparty. Um, what does that mean for, say, a state, state and local government? In our view, the state and local government at the moment, uh, 
it's probably uh, moving forward, especially for the next six to 12, 18 months, um, a heightened focus on procurement and contract management, uh, in particular, robust uh, financial due diligence during the procurement process, consideration of financial security, and then regular and ongoing counterparty due diligence. For principal contractors, our view is that it's very much the next 18 months is a working capital uh, and cash and balance sheet focus, ensuring there are enough funds available and funding lines available to support and uplift in activity as the as the as new government projects come online, um, and also help support a, a likely requirement for, for greater financial security. For subcontractors, it's going to be careful management of project counterparties and careful selection of those. Uh, and a clear understanding of what the payment timeframes and payment claim process looks like. So to speak a little bit about that in more detail using a, a case study, I might pass over to Jamie Harris. Thanks, Mark. Um, so I'm going to do a quick case study on RCR Tomlinson um, uh, to highlight some of the issues that we've talked about today. Uh, so we were appointed administrators of RCR Tomlinson in late 2018 and have subsequently been appointed liquidators. So uh, whilst a lot of work has been done over the last few years, there is still significant work being done on this matter, uh, including statutory investigations and reporting and unwinding some of the long tail infrastructure um, projects that were in place. So I will be uh, uh, talking a little bit at a high level in overview because some of these matters are still live and subject to uh, ongoing uh, stakeholder uh, review and engagement. So uh, apologies that I won't go necessarily into the, the absolute depths of, um, of the matter. But at, at, a, at a higher level, uh, so RCR Tomlinson uh, was a diversified infrastructure and engineering group um, operating across Australia, New Zealand and Southeast Asia. Um, it had an ASX listed uh, head code and 49 subsidiaries across those locations. Uh, as I said, it entered into administration in November 2018. Uh, the business broadly operated uh, in three divisions, being energy, infrastructure and resources, um, and was supported by a centralised corporate division. Uh, the energy division included business units that engaged in the design, supply and construction of power generation plants as well as planned maintenance and refurbishment of those uh, power stations. The infrastructure division uh, included businesses that engaged in uh, power projects, rail and transport, logistics, uh, water treatment and pumping plants, uh, and uh, more relevantly, what I will shortly talk to, the engineering procurement and construction or EPC contracts, and O&M or operation and maintenance contracts uh, for large scale solar energy projects. I'll discuss that in a bit more detail shortly. Uh, the resources division uh, included business units that engaged in the design and construction of resource projects as well as heat treatment plants. Just the next slide, please. Um, in retrospect, um, there are a number of warning signs uh, that lead to the appointment of administrators of the RCR group. Um, I'll focus on the impact of the solar projects as they had the, greater, uh, the greatest impact leading to the appointment of administrators. Uh, and it's also the part of the engagement that I that I lead uh, in what, in dealing with and unwinding uh, the various uh, solar co um, contracts that have been put in place. So in FY18, uh, the group had turnover turnover of approximately two billion dollars. Uh, the group's turnover had doubled in the previous two years, uh, primarily as a result of the strong push uh, into EPC contracts in the solar sector. Uh, in the two years prior to the administration, uh, RCR entered into 15 EPC solar contracts with revenue of $1.2 billion. Prior to this time, uh, uh, RCR had very limited experience uh, in the sector and especially in dealing with uh, the solar sector. Um, such a rapid uh, entry into the solar sector had a number of impacts that RCR uh, was not prepared for. Um, and just to list a few, um, it doubled the size of the group uh, in two years and put strain on the centralised corporate function. Uh, the group had to quickly acquire a significantly larger workforce in each of the engineering, procurement and construction phases of the business. The renewable sector is relatively new in Australia uh, and the pool of genuine experience uh, in that sector is, is relatively shallow and therefore less experienced people uh, were working on some of the matters for RCR. Essentially, because they had so many parallel projects going, um, uh, they, the, the, the true talent and experience in the, in the business was spread very thin across those projects. 
Uh, in order to gain market share, a number of the EPC contracts were principal friendly, um, including being back-ended. Uh, that put um, very large amounts of working capital strain on the group, on the RCR group. Um, additionally, each of the EPC contracts were bespoke um, uh, with a number of non-standing clauses in them. Um, this caused significant difficulty with contract management uh, and rendered some of the dispute processes uh, almost unworkable. Uh, and that was part of the issue uh, that the relationship between the contractor and the principal in a number of uh, these matters had uh, had uh, broken down and the, the underlying documentation was not necessarily helpful in resolving some of those disputes. Almost universally there were time delays and cost overruns in all of the solar projects which obviously put financial uh, strain on, on the business. Additionally, um, given the nature of the construction work that's being done, a number of, number of the actual physical components uh, had to be imported um, from overseas and uh, given RCR was relatively new into the sector, you know, a level of inexperience in the procurement uh, area led to um, inferior and unreliable components being imported and put into some projects. Uh, at the time that the administrators reported, only two projects were complete with the balance um, suffering significant delays. Uh, and forecast future milestone payments, uh, bearing in mind a number of the projects were back-ended, were being eroded by cost overruns, uh, delayed liquidated damages and performance issues on those projects. But more particularly, if you look at the timeline um, uh, as to what happened in the lead-up to the administrator's appointment, in late uh, July 2018, the RCR board uh, discussed material cost overruns on two of the EPC contracts uh, in particular. As it turned out, we probably, um, uh, what, what was revealed that Almost all of them had significant cost overruns, but at the time they, they thought that was only two uh, matters that they were dealing with. Uh, on 30 July uh, 18, RCR shares were put into a trading halt. Then in early July, um, the board discussed a capital raise and one of the early warning signs, the CEO, was replaced. Um, in late August, the FY18 results were released uh, uh, and they um, probably started to paint the picture of, of what the issue was. Um, and um, they also announced the capital raise um, that they needed to do to, to meet the material debt and creditor load. So again, another warning side that um, they were disclosing to the market a material debt position and that the creditor load had built up materially. The capital raise was completed in September. Um, the, the company or well, the group continued to, to suffer um, cash flow difficulties and working capital difficulties through that period. So in late October, contingency planning was commenced and then another early warning sign in November, the CFA resigned. In mid-November, the RCR shares were again placed in a trading halt and RCR was served with, with a shareholder class action and then very soon thereafter, um, when the funding, funding was effectively not available, um, the group had to enter administration. So um, for, a, for a $2 billion business that in different forms had been around for about 100 years, that all happened very quickly at the back end, um, not just because of those solar uh, projects, but a, a very rapid expansion into a sector that they are unfamiliar with, uh, that doubled the size of the business, uh, running so many parallel projects put enormous strain on their business. Uh, next slide. So the, the impact of RCR failing uh, was felt across the whole contracting chain. Um, well, generally, principals had negotiated friendly EPC contracts and um, contractually were in strong positions. Um, the failure of RCR led to each principal having to take back um, the project and, and uh, attempt to complete uh, the projects themselves um, uh, to, get the, uh, to get each project through to um, its construction phase be complete and then through the commissioning and testing phases. Um, generally, retentions and bank guarantees were available to the principals. But delays and cost overruns um, have effectively resulted in losses to principals in, in all of the um, in the matters that we're dealing with. More broadly in the group, uh, and as I alluded to earlier, that um, RCR did a number of uh, different had a number of different business units across um, across the empire. So we were able to um, sell 11 of those business units, but four unprofitable business units um, were wound down over time. Um, originally, there was about 2,000 employees, um, 1,200 of those employees were managed to be transitioned with, with um, business sales, but there were 700 redundancies. So through to individuals, clearly the, the failure of RCR had an impact down to, down to that level as well. And clearly creditors were impacted um, at, at a very high level. Um, uh, $170 million was owed to, to subcontractors and they effectively won't be paid. $230 million were owed to secured financiers, they will be paid in part and $15 million um, will probably be suffered by um, the federal government as shortfall for uh, outstanding employee entitlements that they had to meet that won't be able to be met from the estate. 
So all up and down the chain, um, there has been a, a material financial impact, uh, not only a financial impact, but an operational impact um, uh, through the failure. And again, reflecting on the solar contracts, part of the biggest issue, not only the, the financial impact, was the delay in actually commissioning um, uh, the power stations and the, and the very uh, large penalties that have been incurred by those principals uh, in, in, in because of that. So what were our key observations, uh, especially in relation to the solar business? Um, a rapid expansion into the solar business was not well understood or planned for by the group. Um, the EPC contracts were bespoke, inconsistent and unfavourable to RCR um, and, and potentially poorly drafted. Whilst um, the principals uh, might have thought that was good at the time, it, it actually caused um, a difficulty at the back end with, with some of the um, confusion around uh, uh, the clauses and how they operated and therefore how you work through this, the dispute mechanisms between the principal and the contractor. The risks in the sector were poorly understood by the business um, with uh, RCR effectively entering into fully risk wrapped contracts that ultimately pushed RCR to the point of failure. Um, a lack of experience in entering into too many simultaneous EBC contracts led to cost overruns and material time delays. Um, there appeared to be limited due diligence and contingency planning done um, for such a rapid expansion into a new area of business. And um, probably most importantly, poor document management and payment claim processes led to further dispute and delaying collections. So when we were appointed, there was um, many, many, many tens of millions of dollars in dispute uh, between um, the principals and contractor um, that mostly went to documentation or, or um, poor documentation um, in the process. So in summary, I suppose, it appears that RCR um, had far more significant issues than the board realised uh, six months out from failure, um, uh, but a lot of it comes back to um, how they entered into this solar, the solar sector uh, in, in such a rapid way, and there were a, a range of warning signs around that from really the planning phase through to the execution uh, phase, sorry, planning, documentation and execution phase. So again, um, I think the key message out of that is um, in, in entering into a new area or even um, on large projects, the planning and contingency planning is, is extremely important uh, to make sure that um, if things don't play out the way you hope, that there are uh, alternative paths that you can take that don't force you down uh, a path that leads, leads to potential um, failure of the project. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Jamie. I mean, it, it's unfortunate, but in a lot of these cases, in Jamie's practice, Mark's has said all the time, is that um, you do pull out these very company specific issues that caught, went, led to um, a breakdown in a relationship and ultimately led to a fairly severe financial impact. Um, it's, it's helpful to look back because in hindsight you can get this perspective, but um, a lot of the issues that Jamie just spoke about in respect to this case study are common to others as well. So it, it's helpful to look at an actual case study, but if you look at some of those early warning signs, and Mark touched on them as well, uh, a lot of them are common. Um, of course, it's industry specific, like we're talking about here with solar, uh, but a number of those uh, particular issues uh, come up from time to time in a lot of the different ultimate formal appointments that we see. Well, we have covered early warning signs. We've seen a real life example. I guess our next question is what do we do about it? Um, where we have this insight into where the market's going uh, and what to look out for. What's the appropriate response? Chris, I, I might start with you, if that's okay. Sure, thanks, Scott. Um, I think the um, starting point, uh, as we spoke about earlier, the government's really looking to use um, the construction and infrastructure industry as one of the key pillars of the economic recovery. So that's going to mean more projects coming to market, which is great. But what's going to be critical um, is ensuring that robust procurement processes uh, remain in place for those new projects. And a successful uh, procurement process doesn't just mean necessarily selecting and signing up um, the contractor at the lowest price possible. It's, it's making sure that the procurement process enables the project to be successfully delivered. And at the core of this is ensuring that the procurement strategy um, selects a delivery model that will enable an appropriate um, allocation of risk and a fair price. Um, some of those issues Jamie was talking uh, talking about in that case study clearly hark back to, to the contracts that were entered into, um, just not working out for either party. Um, and to that end, um, and reflecting on the market insights that we discussed earlier, in recent times what we're seeing is a, is a shift towards um, 
or collaborative contracting models. One of the first moves in that space was the New South Wales Government Action Plan. Uh, it was released about two, two and a half years ago and described a desire to foster a thriving and sustainable construction sector, including procuring and managing projects in a more collaborative way and adopting partnership-based approaches to risk allocation. And that's now starting to flow through in the, in the projects that have been procured. And uh, another example is just in the last couple of weeks, um, some work we've been doing with the Victorian Government has received some press. Um, the procurement model for the North East Link PPP projects being altered after bids have been received to incorporate some more collaborative elements. Um, so I think we can expect to see some more of this in the near future, um, particularly while the current market dynamics persist. Uh, from the principal's perspective, um, the key to the successful procurement process is making sure you um, select the right counterparty. Uh, and I'll let Mike talk a bit more about that. Yeah, I think that's right, Chris. The, um, certainly a robust procurement process is obviously one of the key things to select the right counterparty. And, and it's once the, once the counterparty has been identified, it's then ensuring that there's a process in place to regularly check in, regularly test, and understand and ensure that there's a proper due diligence process um, ongoing throughout the life of the, pro, uh, throughout the, life of the contract. Due diligence um, obviously isn't a one-off thing. Um, it shouldn't just be a standalone thing as part of the procurement process. It should become uh, part of the, the contractual uh, framework. Um, and the due diligence process should test and look for uh, the early warning signs that, that a project counterparty, uh, that something is beginning to go off the rails. There are obviously many different uh, counterparty due diligence frameworks uh, in place and, and operating uh, across many businesses. Um, including well, there's, there's one shown uh, on the slide there. But I suppose there's, uh, there's a couple of key things to ensure that um, counterparty due diligence is, is undertaken effectively. Um, they are um, a mix of strong operational and financial data and metrics that really look for and, and bring out any signs of concern. Cadence and discipline around the due diligence process, uh, making sure that we're interrogating, reviewing and then actioning uh, information made available, putting contingency plans in place if something does go wrong, and then finally actually ensuring that the legal framework uh, behind the process uh, is, is fit for purpose uh, and meets the, the due diligence program that you, you hope to put in place commercially. I suppose moving just to the, to the legal framework, look in our experience um, and, and both uh, working in parts of procurement uh, and advising clients during parts of procurement, but also looking back uh, at contract and, and some of the, the work that we did uh, in RCR um, shows that having a, uh, a legal framework that matches uh, the commercial uh, process and, and the things that are done commercially is vitally important. Um, and Scott, if we just should, show the, the next slide if you can. Um, obviously having a, a, a strong contractual framework, a legal framework behind uh, a risk map, behind a, a due diligence process is important uh, and a, a number of um, things to, to keep in mind of through that process. Um, after all, what, what we find is that when things do go wrong, you fall back on the contractual documentation. Um, and it's vitally important that the contractual documentation um, supports what is actually done uh, commercially uh, as it makes the ability to resolve a dispute or an issue or identify a warning sign and then put a mechanism in place to protect against that um, a lot easier. So with that, Scott, I might pass back to, to you to get the conversation flowing. Thanks, Mark. Um, we've got Kim who's now joined us. Welcome, Kim. Um, Thanks, there Scott. are some things that can be there are some things that can be controlled and some that can't. Can you help us with insight in this respect about how to deal with unforeseen events in the context and in the course of also complying with your statutory obligations? Because this might lead to giving um, some tips about how to navigate through unforeseen events which may lead to disputes or even to ultimately litigation. Sure. So on the slide here, we've recommended seven strategies to assist companies um, to deal with unforeseen events. The first four have a financial focus and 
that includes understanding and proactively managing the impact the unforeseen event may have on cash flows, working capital and supply chains. Secondly, investigating and stress testing um, those trading forecasts and urgently assessing the company's cost base. Strategy five on the slide is one that we are um, consistently recommending to businesses of all shapes and sizes. Early engagement with financiers and key stakeholders is of crucial importance, particularly in these challenging times. Keeping those key stakeholders informed and up to date um, helps cement mutual trust and assist to devise strategies to survive the unforeseen event. Strategy six is something that Scott just mentioned and should always be borne in mind. There are a myriad of statutory and common law duties on the part of both directors and employers, which some of which we'll touch on shortly. And finally, strategy seven, keeping that end rebound goal in mind will help to inform the preliminary steps um, that are taken in the lead up. So an appropriate combination of these seven strategies can assist to stabilize a business um, and give it the best possible chance of weathering the storm. So as we just mentioned, there are some statutory obligations that govern um, position of directorship and employer. On this slide, we've included a non-exhaustive list of those. In light of the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been some recent reforms in the insolvency space, some of which we'll touch on today. Um, Firstly, directors have an obligation under Section 588 capital G of the Corporations Act to ensure debts are not incurred while the company is insolvent. A breach of this duty can attract personal liability on the part of the director. Uh, so directors can seek sanctuary from this personal liability by engaging the safe harbour defence pursuant to Section 588 capital G capital A of the Corporations Act. The defence is aimed to encourage directors to um, retain control of the company during financial distress with a view to focusing on some potential restructuring options. So the safe harbour regime excludes liability for insolvent trading if um, one after the person starts to suspect a company is insolvent or may become insolvent, starts to implement one or more courses of action that are reasonably likely to lead to a better outcome for the company. And secondly, that the debt that they incur is directly or indirectly in connection with that cause of action. In March of this year, the Australian government introduced new legislation, excuse me, which created a temporary COVID-19 safe harbour defence. This section provides directors with safe harbour temporary relief due to coronavirus, in that a director will not be personally liable for insolvent trading in respect of debts incurred one, in the ordinary course of the company's business. Two, from the period between 25 March and 31 December this year. And three, before any appointment of a liquidator or administrator to the company. The original safe harbour provisions in Section 588 capital GA will remain an important consideration, mirroring, if possible, this new temporary safe harbour. Accordingly, if the business is insolvent or is likely to become insolvent at a point in time, directors should still ensure that they satisfy um, or explain why they're not able to satisfy the preconditions to safe harbour, including recording that strategy in writing. It's very important to recognise that other directors' duties, such as fiduciary duties, due care and diligence, um, prohibitions against misleading or other associated conduct are not relieved by the temporary amendments to the Corporations Act. So directors must continue to point to a continuing viable business during at least or by the end of, sorry, during or at least by the end of the safe harbour period. Continuing to trade a financially distressed company without purpose is not an option and would probably expose those directors to personal liability under the the existing statutory regimes, regardless of these recent amendments. It is important that directors and officers continue to ensure they're aware of these provisions and assess the company's financial position in a proactive manner, taking advice from advisors when necessary. In terms of the construction industry, it is worth bearing in mind that in order to obtain and maintain a builder's license in Queensland, 
there are minimum financial requirements that must be met. The QBCC can take prompt steps to suspend or cancel a builder's licence um, if there is a contravention, even slight, of these financial requirements. So before engaging in any form of restructuring, including safe harbour, companies need to be aware of and ensure that continued, continued compliance with the minimum financial requirements. The second reform, which I'll touch on briefly, noting we want to leave some time for questions, um, is one to be introduced at the beginning of 2021 in a bid to support small business recovery. So it's proposed that directors retain control of the business, its property and affairs, while developing a plan to restructure the business's debts in um, conjunction with a small business restructuring practitioner. The draft bill was introduced to Parliament last week. The regulations are still yet to be released. So we have an idea of the broad framework of the reforms, um, which I'll share with you today. So the key elements are, firstly, to introduce a new formal debt restructuring process for eligible businesses to allow a faster and less complex mechanism to restructure existing debts and maximise chances of survival. Um, and secondly, a simplified liquidation pathway for eligible small businesses to allow a faster and lower cost liquidation process. And we think this would in turn increase returns for creditors and employees. So the high points of the proposed reforms are businesses with less than $1 million in liabilities can engage an independent small business practitioner. And at that point, unsecured and secured creditors um, cannot take action against the company nor can a personal guarantee be enforced against a director or, the, or a relative of the director, and ipso facto clauses can't be triggered. The business and the practitioner will then have 20 business days to come up with a plan, um, after which creditors will have 15, days to con 15 business days to consider and vote upon the plan. The secured creditors' rights and the statutory um, priority rights under the Corps Act won't be affected in that they will continue to operate as normal. The plan will be binding on unsecured creditors if more than 50% in value vote in favour of the plan. Um, and secured creditors will only be bound to the extent, extent their debt exceeds the realisable value of their security interest. So some um, things worth mentioning about what remains unclear. We're not yet sure what information the small business and the practitioner will need to provide to creditors to enable them to consider the plan and assess whether it is something they're willing to support. We anticipate that would be full transparency of financials and at the very least sufficient information in an uncomplicated and easy to digest manner um, to enable creditors to make an informed decision on the plan. Uh, there's also no provision for debts incurred during the restructure period to be paid in priority to pre-restructuring debts. Um, that, and likewise, if a liquidation did eventuate, there's at present no distinction between the priority that, that would be afforded to pre-restructuring debts and restructuring debts. Um, so we question whether that would mean creditors and suppliers are less likely to do business with a business that is subject to one of these plans, um, given the risk that they may ultimately end up being an unsecured creditor um, if the plan falls over or is terminated for any reason. So it might be that cash on delivery terms are insisted upon. Um, and a, another risk is that suppliers withhold supply until they're paid in full, meaning that it makes it very hard for the business to continue to trade. Um, so in our view, there needs to be a balance between the creditor's interests as a whole and also um, making sure this small business restructuring plan can be as beneficial as possible to those wishing to use it. Um, so we'll keep our Clayton Newt's website up updated as more and more rolls out. It's sort of a, a work in progress at the moment. So the next slide we'll just touch on briefly is ensuring a, a co corporation can be dispute ready. So the three tips we recommend here are ensuring that you have good corporate governance. Secondly, having in place a sound document management system. So documents, as you'll know, are critical at all stages, 
leading up to a dispute, but also in the throes of the dispute itself. Even before a dispute is on the horizon though, having good sound document management will ensure companies are across contract timeframes, um, ensuring they can issue notices at the appropriate time in respect of warranties, rights on default, etc. So having um, a, a sound document management system and a person responsible for those key dates is, is really helpful. And the third one is, um, as we mentioned previously, having strong relationships with stakeholders. Coupled with that, on the next slide is early engagement with advisors. The restructuring and turnaround specialists, including lawyers and accountants, can assist to facilitate better planning, responsive action and compliance with those statutory and common law obligations we've mentioned today. And on the next slide, we have set out, a, by way of a refresher, some of the solvent and insolvent restructuring options available. Insolvency is not a prerequisite to restructuring. There are, of course, solvent mechanisms by which um, companies can maximise strategic position and value. These can include an independent business review um, and engagement of the safe harbour mechanisms that I discussed today. To the extent insolvency is a factor, restructuring options can include voluntary administrations leading to a deed of company arrangement and receiverships. So all of these um, options on the slide can be utilised and utilised early and do not need to be a measure of last resort. They're not something to necessarily be scared of or shied away from because used effectively, they can make or break a business and enhance outcomes for creditors, including suppliers and employees. So we'll now move to our Q&A session, at which point I will hand back to Scott. Thanks very much, Kim. Um, in the time we've got remaining, I'll just, I might ask Jamie this. The, um, we've seen a little insight into where we might get to next year, Jamie. There's been, Safe Harbour has been in place for a while. Uh, there's Safe Harbour Mark II, effectively, during the COVID <coughs> period. We've seen what might happen next year. For our clients and those on this call, um, we've got the whole range, but including um, for principals uh, and for funders. They might be facing counterparties to contracts who are engaged, who have engaged Safe Harbour formally or otherwise, or have taken advantage of the new regime, which applies to sub $1 million turnover companies. I wonder this, um, what's, what's been the take up so far, Jamie? Have you had um, a fair chunk of Safe Harbour engagements uh, or is it a bit patchy? Are people actually having a look or is, is hope their strategy? Yeah, look, our experience has been it's been inconsistent, is the honest answer. Um, the underlying regimes that are in place, the original uh, Safe Harbour and Safe Harbour, Safe Harbour Mark II are actually very good regimes. Mm -hmm. um, so again, you, you only need to engage them when you need to engage them. But, but our experience has been, um, uh, as I said, inconsistent. And concerningly, there are businesses of reasonable size and, and good levels of sophistication that are still running a little bit, it'll be okay strategy. Yeah. Um, and she'll be right, mate, um, which, which given the regimes are in place, and I, and I think are in place for very good reason, and they're, and they're good, robust um, uh, regimes. Yes, there is a cost, there's a professional fee cost in going through the process, but why wouldn't you take that protection mechanism? It, it gives you the backstop if things don't play out the way. If it's not okay, if, it's, if, if it doesn't play out, that she'll be okay. You, you've got that regime um, in place um, to allow you um, the protection or to afford you the protection um, of, of continuing to trade. So um, our recommendation would be um, if you think you have concerns in that area, um, I would be engaging with the regime, getting the right advice and, and making a proactive decision as to whether it is appropriate to, to get to enter safe harbour uh, rather than just hoping. Mm. And I think that one thing that also should be embraced on the other side of the contractual bargain, like we're talking about now, we mentioned at the start, is that if you have a counterparty who's going through a safe harbour process, part of that includes a proper plan, even the new regime, although it's um, somewhat director led, there is a requirement for a professional to be involved. If you can pay to a contract, engagement with that company during that process doesn't always lead to, the inev to an inevitable outcome, which is insolvency. No. There can be um, a, an outcome which is better for both parties than a straight liquidation. Um, we've come to the close to the end of the time. I might throw one more question, if it's okay. Uh, and for those other questions that have come through, we're, we're happy to deal with them um, outside of uh, this live event. 
Um, Chris, maybe for you, Mark spoke earlier and we've seen it in the examples through Jamie's example. We've heard Kim talking about uh, what strategies might be in, be put in place in order to assist um, when you're seeing some of these early warning signs. Is there anything that you've seen in your roles in the delivery of, of some of those larger projects which are, are perhaps uh, examples of your concerns for clients regarding their contractors? Uh, thanks, Scott. Yeah, I think it tends to be sort of fairly evident um, in the behaviour of the contractors during that delivery phase. I mean, contractors have always and will continue to really push the envelope on claims, no doubt there, but, but I think we're sort of seeing that taken to almost a new level um, and at times uh, almost a real desperation for cash, um, running some odd arguments at times, um, but really... Um, just trying to get that further extra cash out of out of the principal and, and it speaks to those cash flow problems that Mike was speaking about earlier. Um, so yeah, I think that's definitely become sort of increasingly prevalent over the over the last couple of years. Thanks very much. Well, we've probably uh, got to the end of the presentation in terms of time and we don't wish to run over, but you'll see on the last slide there a summary of where we've got to and some of the key take key takeaways. Um, ultimately, we hope um, you've seen from some of the case examples from uh, our current uh, and recent past experience and a little bit of a look into the future uh, that to the extent that you're either faced yourself or uh, you're on the other side of the contractual bargain where you're engaging with a party, then some tips as to early warnings. We hope that you've taken away from this and also um, look out because we think, given Jamie's uh, insight into how much advice is being sought and that it's a bit sporadic, uh, I think we're going to be um, looking at this issue very closely uh, over the course of the next six to 12 months and even beyond, not just in this industry, the subject of our topic um, today, but more generally. So um, feel free. Uh, hopefully to have a closer look at the slides and the recording, but otherwise we thank you very much for your attendance uh, and we hope you enjoyed it. Thanks again.